may be bent with the penalty of sin, but he can make you straight again. You can be in your car, you can be in your shower, you can be all by yourself, but you can call on his name and he will hear you. God wants to prepare you for a spiritual promotion. We plead the blood of Christ on whatever you're going through. Good evening and welcome back to Mount Belton Missionary Baptist Church, 1620 Helena Street in the wonderful and bold new city of the South, Jacksonville, Florida. We are so glad that you're able to join in for part two this week. We started last week talking about Samson and with Samson, I wanted to give you the full spectrum of the things on Samson because I wanted you to know the four women that had an influence on his life. So we started with his mother and we, the promise that she had. The promise gave the restrictions on what Samson could and could not do since he was a Nazarite. What gave him the, the secret to his strength and the things that he could eat, not eat, drink and not drink. And of course, the cutting of his locks, his dreadlocks, his hair. So we went from his mother and the promise of the coming of Samson to we started to talk about Samson's wife. Most people don't know Samson had a wife. But what was very important that I wanted to highlight was we talked about reciprocity. I always mix two words up. It's reciprocity. Reciprocity, we commonly call that karma. So it's based on the reactions that come to your actions. So we talked about because of the way that Samson treated his first wife, that would be the karma that would come back to him when he got to deal with Delilah. But the woman in between Samson's wife and Delilah was a prostitute. Even though we only talked about what I call a one night stand, that's what we're going to start off with on part two tonight. So this whole series is called Samson when God's comp I'm sorry when God's compassion triumphs over our carelessness because that's really what we're talking about we're looking at Samson who is a heroic figure in the Bible but we're talking about the manly side of him and the triumphs and the tragedies of his life so we start tonight with number three the woman the prostitute and the one night stand and this, once again, is coming from Judges chapter 16, and I'm reading from the easy to read version. It says, one day Samson went to the city of Gaza. He saw a prostitute there and went in to stay the night with her. Someone told the people of Gaza, Samson has come here. They wanted to kill him, so they surrounded the city. They hid near the city gate and waited all night for him. They were very quiet all night long. They had said to each other, when morning comes, we will kill Samson. But Samson only stayed with the prostitute until midnight. Then he got up and grabbed the doors of the city gate and pulled them loose from the wall. He pulled down the doors, the two posts and the bars that locked the door shut. He put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill near the city of Hebron. Now, I mentioned this section just to show that sometimes God allows us to escape from strange and ungodly situations. God has given us the desires of our hearts, even when we have operated outside of his heart. In Psalms 37 and 4, we read, delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Maybe you've been lacking in certain areas, a job. Or relationship we can start to compare ourselves to others who are more fulfilled at least as our eyes see it and can become envious of those people sometimes we can even go as far as to envy those who do evil we see that they seem to be prospering in the things they do wrong and wonder why we shouldn't do the same wrong ourselves on top of that we can begin to blame God for our circumstances. We can harden our hearts, not just against others, but against him, God as well. The earlier version of Psalm 37 speaks precisely of these types of situations. In verse one, David writes, do not fret because of those who do evil or be envious of those who do wrong. In fact, the context of Psalms 37 and 4 is in direct contrast 
to these earlier verses like verse one. When we harden our hearts in these ways, we can become unpliable in our hearts, which means that nothing can penetrate our hearts. We can end up focusing on all of these things instead of focusing on God. We want to delight in these other things, and when they don't work out, our hearts can harden. God wants us to focus and delight in him instead. And when we don't do that, our hearts can remain soft and easily moldable. You understand what I'm saying? Our heart is not callous anymore. It is able to be molded and it's pliable. The love of God can now penetrate to the bottom of our hearts. Not everything our heart desires is good. In fact, Jeremiah 17 and 9 tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things. Think about it for a moment. What our heart desires when someone has wronged us, we want revenge. We may even wish harm on the other person. Or we may envy others and desire even the very thing they have, their spouse. Hey, David, I'm talking to you. Remember when you looked down at Beersheba from your balcony and began to desire in your heart a woman that belonged to another man? God has given to us even the desires of our own hearts. James 4 and 3 also tells us that often when we ask God for things we don't receive because we ask with the wrong intentions and the wrong motives so that we may spend what we get on our pleasures. In other words, we often desire things that we can delight in those things for only ourselves. We begin to be selfish and selfless. What we desire can become idols in our lives. God isn't going to grant us the very things that would take his place or draw us further away from him. Samson spends time with his professional woman who works in an industry that's been around for a very long time. And yet God provides him with an experience and an escape plan that allows him to elude men that desire to kill him. So let's get to this woman, this fourth woman, Delilah. Samson moves now to a woman who wants to trap him. She even goes as far as to plainly tell Samson exactly what her plans are. But yet, for whatever reason, he ignores her words and her warnings. So let's pick up in verse number four. It says later, Samson falls in love with a woman named Delilah, who was from Shorek Valley. The rulers of the Philistines went to Delilah and said, we want to know what makes Samson so strong. Try to trick him into telling you his secret. Then we will know how to capture him and tie him up. Then we will be able to control him. If you do this, each of us will give you 28 pounds of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, tell me why you are so strong. How could someone tie you up and make you helpless? Then I began to ask these questions. What makes Samson fall in love with this woman that desires to collect a bounty on his head. Why does Samson begin to play this game of lies with Delilah? Let's go through the list of lies. Lie number one is found in verse number seven. Samson answered, someone would have to tie me up with seven fresh new bowstrings. If someone did that, I would be as weak as any other man. The second lie, he, we find that in verse number 11, Samson said, someone would have to tie me up with new ropes. They would have to tie me with ropes that have not been used before. 
If someone did that, I would become as weak as any other man. Then line number three, Samson says, if you use the loom to weave the seven braids of hair on my head and tighten it with a pen, I will become as weak as any other man. Well, let me tell you something about Samson. Samson told these three different lies that to each one, he told Delilah that I will become as weak as any other man. But let me tell you how he became weak before they tried these actions, new ropes, woven ropes, all of these things that he said. He became weak because he felt that it was necessary to lie to somebody. Is that you? Do you always try as I have done myself because I'm a victim of my own message tonight, my own teaching, because there were times that I felt in order to impress somebody, I had to what they call stretch the truth. Because I will tell you inside of most lies, there lies the truth. So Samson was becoming weak because he felt that it was necessary to lie to try to impress someone. And this woman here, he's trying to em employ her love by impacting a lie. Samson, we've got to do better than this, my brother. We can't let people's influence influence us to try to lie to get more of an influence through them. So Samson is playing games with a very serious opponent. People have said that love don't cost a thing, but Samson is about to find out that love can cost you everything. One, his love is going to cost him his hearing. Every time he, he's laughing during the lie, he does not hear this woman's warning to him. Look again at verse seven. Samson answered, someone would have to tie me up with seven fresh new bowstrings. If someone did that, I would be as weak as any other man. Then the rulers of the Philistines brought seven fresh new bowstrings to Delilah and she tied Samson with the bowstrings. Hold up. Wait a minute. Let me put some reality in it. Brothers, I remember a long time ago, I listened to a comedian that was talking about how couples carry on in the bedroom. And he said, don't put no handcuffs on me because I've been to jail before and ain't nothing sexy about handcuffs. I believe that was Don D.C. Curry that said that I want to give him credit because he's a funny man. But inside of every joke, there lives reality. Samson. Look at what you're doing, even though you know it's a lie, but look at the position you're putting yourself in. You, you are allowing this woman that you love to tie you up to try to prove an invalid point. Verse nine says, some men were hiding in the next room. Delilah said to Samson, Samson, the Philistine men are going to capture you. Verse 11, Samson said, someone would have to tie me up with new ropes. They would have to tie me with ropes that have not been used before. If someone did that, I would become as weak as any other man. So Delilah took some new ropes and tied up Samson. Samson, my brother, what are you doing? Here you are in a lie and again, you allow this woman to handcuff you with ropes. So Delilah took some new ropes and tied up Samson. Some men were hiding in the next room. Didn't we just hear that before? Then Delilah called out to him, Samson, the Philistine men are going to capture you. Let's look at verse 13b. Samson said, if you use the loom, to weave the seven braids of hair on my head and tighten it with a pen, I will become as weak as any other man. Later, Samson went, Samson went to sleep. So Delilah used the loom to weave the seven braids of hair on his head. 
Then Delilah fastened the loom to the ground with a tent peg. Again, she called out to him, Samson, the Philistine men are going to capture you. Samson fails to realize that he's playing a game of love with someone that doesn't even love him. Delilah cares more about how she looks in the public eye than showing love to Samson. She at no time ever claims or says that she loves Samson. How can he be in love with a woman that doesn't love him? Or I'm going to ask you, how can you be in love with someone that does not love you? She is in a relationship for personal gain. What can Samson truly see in Delilah? She's a bounty hunter or for what we call today a gold digger. It may not be Samson's personal goal, but she definitely shows up with a shovel. Why do fools fall in love? Why do people become blinded by love? Why do we choose to sacrifice so much for people who never even lift a finger for us? What does Samson get out of this deal? Watch how Delilah uses Samson's love to play on his emotions, even though it's hard to feel sorry for Samson because he should not have been playing with Delilah in the first place. Come on, y'all. We've gotten trapped as kids in the sandbox and came home dirty, and our parents asked us, why were you playing in the dirt and mess up your good clothes? Verse 6 says, so Delilah said to Samson, tell me why you are so strong. How could someone tie you up and make you helpless. Notice what Delilah does not say. We start off this story saying that Samson falls in love with Delilah. Delilah's response to Samson is not, oh, you love me? Well, Samson, I love you too. That is not what she's saying. She follows up from Samson proclaiming his love for her, asking a question that shows where Delilah's heart really is. She says, tell me why you're so strong. How could someone tie you up and make you helpless? Well, Samson, I got another answer for you. We can be so ignorantly in love that we blindly walk into a trap set to us except for us by someone that does not love us. Samson, if he was in his right mind, should have asked her right then, why do you need to know what makes me weak? Why aren't you asking what makes me strong? Delilah is not a lover. Delilah is a loser. Listen to her sad song. Verse 10 says, then Delilah said to Samson, you lied to me. You make me look foolish. Verse 13, then Delilah said to Samson, you lied to me again. You made me look foolish. Verse 15, then Delilah said to Samson, how can you say I love you? when you don't even trust me. You refuse to tell me your secret. This is the third time you made me look foolish. You haven't told me the secret of your great strength. She kept bothering Samson day after day. Finally, hmm, Samson gives in. Look at verse 16b. And once again, I'm reading this from the easy to read version, the translation of the Bible. Verse 16b says, he got so tired of her asking him about his secret that he felt like he was going to die. Finally, Samson told Delilah everything. 
He said, I have never had my hair cut. I was dedicated to God before I was born. If someone shaved my head, I would lose my strength. I would become as weak as any other man. Well, listen to the sound of alarm. Samson, you had already become weak before your hair was ever cut because you were so blinded by love that you couldn't see how to deal with a person that did not love you. Or, hmm, are you now dealing with the law of reciprocity or dealing with what we refer to, as I discussed in part one, you are now being a victim of karma because the way you treated your wife is now the way you're being treated by Delilah. You are falling in the lines of trickery and deception and you are participating because you are laughing your way through your own lies of deceit and deception with Delilah. It's like being on a seesaw. You're going up and you're going down. But my friend Samson, you may have Delilah raised up because of the love you have for her. And then now she raises you up. But instead of balancing this love off where both people are on the same level, guess what happens to you? When you have her up and raised so high upon her pedestal, she jumps off the seesaw and she hits you where it really hurts. Oh, every man is cringing now because you know exactly what I'm talking about. She brings you to your spiritual knees and your physical knees because now you are feeling her wrath towards you based on the karma of when you had someone that loved you like your wife did. You've now gone through a prostitute with a one night stand that God made an escape plan for you that you were able to get away before the Philistine men came to kill you. But you wanted to play this game with Delilah, and now you have placed yourself in the hands of a gold digger who's about to take away all your fortune that God has blessed you with. Verse 18 says, Delilah saw that Samson had told her his secret. She sent a message to the rulers of the Philistines. She said, come back again. Samson has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines came back and brought the money that they had promised to give her. Remember, there wasn't a total of 28 pounds. It was 28 pounds from each one of them. Delilah, the gold digger of all, is now set herself up to be a rich woman by using a man's love for her to satisfy her own personal desires. Verse 19 said, Delilah got Samson to go to sleep with his head lying in her lap. Then she called in a man to shave off the seven braids of Samson's hair. In this way, she made Samson weak and his strength left him. Then Delilah called out to Samson, Samson, hmm, here we go again for the fourth time. The Philistine men are going to capture you. He woke up and thought, I will escape as I did before and free myself. But Samson did not know that the Lord had left him. Samson ends up getting played because he played himself. God will still sometimes give you the desires of your heart even if it means allowing you to suffer through your own stupidity. You can't keep playing with people that don't have your best interest in mind. God has a divine destiny for you, but he will let you travel through your own destructive detours. Pastor Heron once explained to us that life is like a playground. It's not a playground. It's a battleground. Samson loses his mind, his love, his hair, 
and his eyes. But most of all, he loses his connection with God. Verse 21, the Philistine men captured Samson. They tore out his eyes and took him down to the city of Gaza. They put chains on him and kept him from running away. They put him in a prison and made him work grinding cane. But his hair began to grow again. The Philistine rulers came together to celebrate. They were going to offer a great sacrifice to their God, Dagon. They said, our God helped us defeat Samson, our enemy. When the Philistines saw Samson, they praised their God. They said, this man destroyed our people. He killed many of our people, but our God helped us take our enemy. The people were having a good time at the celebration. So they said, bring Samson out. We want to make fun of him. So they brought Samson from the prison and made fun of him. They made him stand between the columns of the temple of the God of Dagon. A servant was holding his hand. Samson said to him, put me where I can feel the columns that hold this temple up. I want to lean against them. The temple was crowded with men and women. All the Philistine rulers were there. There were about 3,000 men and women on the roof of the temple. They were laughing and making fun of Samson. Then Samson said a prayer to the Lord. Lord God, remember me? God, please give me my strength one more time. Let me do this one thing to punish these Philistines for tearing out both of my eyes. Then Samson took hold of the two columns in the center of the temple that supported the whole temple. He braced himself between the two columns. One column was on the right side and the other on his left side. So Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed as hard as he could and the temple fell on the rulers and everyone in it. In this way, Samson killed many more Philistines when he died than when he was alive. Wow. Can you see the love of God in the forgiving as we detour through our own destructions, destructive measures? Samson received the promise of God, but in the end, it was God's mercy that allowed him to prevail over his enemies one more time. God has a divine plan in store for you. It does not mean that you won't have to go through some things to get there. But don't let the land of lies become a place where you post up your tent. God wants you to be blessed and he wants you to be loved. And he's showing love even in the midst of tragedy right now. He's showing his love to you. Will you appreciate his love or will you take it for granted? Ask God to show you how to love again. And he will present himself before you because he is a God of promise. He promised to never leave us or forsake us. And he will always be true to himself. May God keep you. And may God bless you is our prayer.